inveigled, I use that word deliberately, into giving this talk because um, Isabella de Carey's wants to know why is it that artists somehow seem to look at things differently uh, to the lay person. And that, that was a very interesting thing, uh, thing to think about. Um, so I want, to, I want to use three words deliberately and I'm going to explain what each word stands for within the context of what I'm saying. That's a technique I learned from Martin Carter. Always, always give your definitions of words before you begin speaking because people have their own thoughts about those words. So the three words I want to deal with are looking, seeing, and awareness. The birth of a child is the birth of looking because I have, I have noticed when you look into the eyes of a baby say so between three to six months, you can see those eyes are not, as we would say, focused, but those eyes are taking in everything. They're seeing everything. So a little child um, up to um, five, five years old, they are seeing literally everything. It's just that they, don't, they haven't yet acquired language to express what they're seeing. And I feel that the expression that, that by acquiring language, it somehow puts a little bit of a, a, a blinder over their seeing, their looking and seeing. Because then you want to talk about what you're looking and seeing rather than really, really looking and seeing. Now I say looking is the first stage, which is followed by seeing. And seeing to my mind is more focused. You look here, yeah, you look, you look, and you notice um, in language you say, we look at. You will say, I have seen somebody but when you're looking, you say, you look, I looked at somebody. So looking, looking is removed from seeing. And that is, that is the position I'm taking. Now, both looking and seeing are encapsulated or contained within awareness, because that's what awareness is all about. Awareness is taking in what is around you. And awareness will involve all of your senses. It's just that I'm going to be concentrating on the seeing part. But awareness also deals with what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're tasting, what you're touching. So awareness is the overall generic term that encapsulates uh, a looking and seeing. So I'm gonna concentrate on the looking and seeing part of it. So I said, looking is the first stage, seeing is the second stage when you begin to focus on something. Um, is it that, it is that particular kind of focusing that creates the artist. But that looking and seeing and that awareness, it involves every single activity you can think about, looking and seeing and being aware of what you do. It involves every activity. Now, in the case of the visual artist, um, it will involve your perception of, uh, not necessarily in this order because seeing is something that is total. So you're seeing a combination of colors, of texture, shape, and form, all within space. So seeing involves all of that. It involves your relationship to space, if you're near or far from something. Space. It's not just... Those are the tools that the artist would use in seeing, because the artist is, is not just looking at something, but he is seeing something within that which he or she is looking. The seeing involves looking into, as apart from looking at. So you, you will look at a mango, but then you'll begin to see the little dots that tells you this mango got worms. So if you do not concentrate your looking, you will not spot that. So that is a, that's part of the awareness. Now, that, that the artist is using that, but that has to be placed within, within an ambience, within an environment, within a context. So that looking of shape, color, form, what have you, will take place within whatever the environment the artist will find himself in. And those environments will be 
a natural environment, the social environment, domestic environment. Each one is an environment that can be explored through seeing, through looking at and seeing into each one of those environments. So depending on your particular interest or orientation, you'll be looking at and seeing into a specific thing within the environment, within the social or domestic uh, environment, within the political environment. Those are all environments. So now the, within the artist, of course, is tends to be located within the natural environment in a very specific way. And that specific way in which the artist is looking depends on those um, things that I spoke about, the color, shape, form of things, textures of something. So that is what will cause them to see and look into, apart from looking at. Oh yeah, look at a tree. But when I look at a tree, I'm not just I'm not I'm seeing certain things. I'm seeing the pattern of the bark. Why does the bark seem to have a certain the bark may look haphazard in its cracking? When you look at it carefully, you can actually pick out a certain pattern. The pattern may not be quite obvious, but you can see that pattern. So um, the artist is working within that and natural environment, which will involve landscape painting. When the artist is involved in the social environment, it will be the reproduction of people and the things that they do. So that's the reaction of the artist to their particular uh, uh, environment. Um, now, apart from that, looking and seeing with the artist, those things are looked, looking and seeing is also looked with an ability, a natural ability to draw or to paint. In other words, to express yourself to the things you paint, draw, or make. And so those abilities compounded with this business of looking at textures and so on, will then allow you to produce the paintings and the sculptures and the pottery and what have you. So now, for a person who has um, a different orientation, who is still involved in awareness and looking and seeing, that person then may become an engineer or an architect. It all depends on your natural inclination and abilities. And of course, those natural inclinations and abilities will also include your genetic inheritance. And I know that for sure. My, my grandfather was a cabinet maker. Uh, my father who had to make a, a, a living hard times, did all kinds of things, which also involved making furniture for our little house. Um, the chiffonier, uh, the side table, um, the dining table, things like that. And so I picked up on that because I like to make things. And I started very early as a child by chipping away at pieces of wood at a razor blade, a double-edged razor blade until I you know, got other things going. Mm. So the, 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 your, your genetic inheritance will also determine the way in which you um, approach awareness, looking and seeing and awareness. It will determine that. So the artist works in, um, in, in, um, in that way. Uh, special abilities will determine how you use the, the, um, the products, the experiences of your senses. So if I'm a, a musician, I'll be tuned into songs like Keith Waite, the flautist. So Keith said as a child, he lived in the Northwest where you get a lot of songbirds. So he got interested in those songs. And um, in London, he said with his flute, he used to get birds coming into his backyard because he used to imitate the, song, the, the, the songs of the birds. He would hide himself and play the flute and the birds would come into the garden. So that was his thing, his thing was auditory. But he was also see, hearing, I would say the hearing part of it was then focused. Like the artist, the visual part is focused. The athlete, the athletic part is focused. And the, the, the beautiful example of that would be Muhammad Ali. He was, he was totally a body person. And he would have been doing yoga or something, but he was a body person. And that's the reason why he was able to do the kind of things he did in the ring. Because his, 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 um, his focus, his seeing was in his body, not in his eyes, it was in his body. So he was able to do those things. Um, so 
the, the, the looking at and seeing coordinated with your own inheritance and your interests will allow you to perform in the specific areas determined by those abilities. Movement, you'll be a dancer. Sound, you'll be a musician. Sight, you'll be an artist, somebody who make, likes to make things. Our indigenous peoples in Guyana are beautiful, superb examples of this business of seeing. So in the bush, as we call it, they're able to see things that, that we don't because they, they are into seeing in a very highly specific, specific manner. And, um, but because they are so related to their, they're so linked up with their environment, it allows them to see as opposed to just look. They're into seeing because their life depends on how well they can see. Little indications within the environment will tell them whether it is dangerous or whether it is safe. And it is a bit seeing. It's like the boat, the bowman in the boat paddling going up the river without boat motor. He's right up in the bow of the boat with a paddle. And he, and he is motionless. I used to observe that. He is like a rock sitting there, motionless. And then I'd ask Bobby Fernandez, what the hell is he doing? I was not seeing because if I, I was looking at the man and not because if I was looking, I would have seen that he was making little signals like that with his fingers, little signals. So when Bobby pointed that out to me, that is when I began to see the bowman because the little flicks of the fingers would tell you, go this way, go that way, slow down. That was it. You know? And I asked Bobby, what was he look? What is he seeing? He said, he is, he is looking at the surface of the water, but where the surface of the water is smooth, something is hidden out of there, probably a rock. So he's looking at the river, but also seeing into it and reading its thing. So that's, that's the difference between uh, um, looking at seeing into and awareness. And that is what differentiates the artist from the normal person who um, does not, or would not, should not, I don't know, um, does not use their eyes in that very highly uh, uh, differentiated uh, uh, manner. So it's like a, a, a detective, a detective will be looking at a crime scene, but also would be seeing into what he's looking at, what she's looking at. So that's, that's, that's what, what they're looking and seeing. It's not something really, it's only to artists, it involves um, every one of us. And it's a question of how much we are prepared um, to use our, our abilities to see as opposed to just look. And the way in which we are able to use our looking and seeing abilities and put it into harness with our particular uh, orientation in order to allow us to live in a certain manner. So there's, there, there's that kind of, um, if I might use the word, big up word, there's that kind of philosophical underpinning and there's also the psychological uh, things to looking and seeing. So looking and seeing could take us into those two areas, into philosophy, which is looking and seeing uh, with the mind and thoughts. And um, it can also take us into science, looking and seeing. Psychiatry and psychology is looking and seeing into the mind of the person kind of thing. So that looking and seeing is something that involves human beings. It also involves uh, animals as well. Animals look, animals see a lot. Otherwise they couldn't exist. They see a lot. You know, they talk about a hawk eye and think the eye of a hawk. Yeah. Seeing every seeing, really seeing. Looking at the environment and then seeing into it. So looking at and seeing into uh, the, the two words I leave you with. Um, you know, to, to think about. Um, I would now like to give some examples. Um, the, I take uh, Ozzy Hussein as my example of an indig indigenous individual who, um, because of his background, his cultural background, was able to produce uh, sculptures 
of a very unique and extraordinary quality. Um, the first one I would like to us to look at is the one, the bird. I saw that on the desk of um, Dennis Williams and I went to visit him once and I said, who did that? He said, Ozzy, I said, Ozzy, he said, yes. I know Ozzy was saying, who's our brother to George Simon, he used to be, he used to come around the art school every now and again. But then where the art school is located then in, Lam in um, Kamaiko Street, next door to the, to the um, presidential house, government house. The, the, the movement in the school then was very focused on sculpture. So as he saw people making sculpting things and decided he can make, he can sculpt as well. And so I saw this little bird and he said, but this is incredible because the concept of a bird and egg is within that single sculpture. You can see the egg form, but when you look at it, you can also see the beak of the toucan. So he chose the toucan bird as opposed to any other bird because of the curve of his beak to enable him to incorporate the bird into the egg. And so you have an interesting uh, uh, piece to speculate about which came first, the bird or the egg. You know, it is a, it's a remarkable piece. And I'm very pleased to have acquired it from, um, from Aussie. I look at it all the time and marvel at it. Um, the second piece I acquired from him was the one I call called the vine. And you can see it has that, a very definitive uh, 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 presence for one. And that's the thing about sculpture. Sculpture has a certain kind of physical presence that painting does not. And so you, 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 um, you react to sculpture as how you would react to another person. At least that's how you should in my mind. Rather than just looking at it, you react to it because it has a presence. It has a kind of physical presence. A painting has a physical presence but it also carries uh, um, uh, 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 invented things like you, you think you're seeing into a landscape, a perspective, but it's all optical illusions. Sculpture does not present you with optical illusions because it's right there in front of you. So that's the difference between the two. Anyway, that piece when I saw it reminded me very much of my own string about in the bush and looking at vines, the kind of, of forms that, that vines created is just, just remarkable. There's one of them, I've lost the, the, the piece that I used to have, which is called monkey ladder. The monkey ladder is a perfect example of what the um, mathematicians call a sine curve, a curve that goes like that. It's a perfect example. It's mathematically very accurate. And it's a wonderful thing to observe, the monkey ladder, you know. Um, I don't have a piece of that to show you, unfortunately, but if you go to the, to the museum or go into the botanical gardens, you'll probably see it hanging from the trees, monkey ladder. It has that kind of thing about it. It has an inside outside look when you look at it because of how it's weaving. Because one part of it is concave, that part. And then when we look at the other side, the other side is convex. Early works, I like all these early works because to me, they, they, bring, they, they show not only his physical relationship to the land and to the bush as we call it, but also he was trying to bring a, a spiritual dimension into his work. All these early works are extremely powerful and evocative. Um, which brings me um, to my um, part of the thing. When I was growing up as a child, I used to go to um, <clears throat> Agricola, <clears throat> excuse me, because my mother's aunt Iris lived there. <clears throat> and I used to notice that on the, the plants that I examined, because I like to look at things as well and see things, I used to notice these little round pots, tiny little round pots. And when I asked who made them, um, I was told that the Marabantas made them. Now, Marabanta is actually the Spanish word for ant, but we use it to describe a wasp. So I would look at these things and, um, well, I started, of course, to break them open to see what they got inside. And I realized that they were hollow. And inside were the tiny little caterpillars that the, um, the Marabuntas used to, used to inject and uh, uh, put them inside there so that the eggs would feed on them. So those Marabuntas were very skilled physicians. So they were using, they were using drugs like we use to, to, to anesthetize people and they were doing it for centuries. Nature is always 200% nature's always or more ahead of what we think we know and what we think we have invented. Nature has done it and much more efficiently. I looked at the pot. 
it's hollow? I said, wait, um, a marabanta does not have brains. So now I'm, I'm deciding on, so I'm being, becoming now very scientific. A marabanta does not have brains. A marabanta does not have hands and fingers. Now, I have brains and I have hands and fingers, so I should be able to make a pot. So I got some clay and I made a little pot. I got very scientific. We had a cold pot, as we call it. My mother, when she's baking bread, bread is soft, yes. You put it into the oven and it comes out hard, perfect. So my pot is soft. So I'm gonna put it under the cold pot, like a, like a little oven underneath there, and it will get hard. The logic is inescapable. My little pot exploded. My mother came out. <laughs> What are you doing? And that was the end. <laughs> that was the end of my adventures into ceramics and pottery until years later. Um, but you see the way in which my looking at involves seeing, and then my particular um, inclinations allowed me to do certain things. So that's the story of the Marabunta pot. So later when I started making pots, the second uh, um, illustration is what I call a yam pot. Now the yam pot is, is, is based upon my observation of yams and edos. You go into the store to buy a shop to buy yams and edos and all of that. And the three little spouts on the top of it would represent the shoots that come out of the yam and it's growing on the ground. So persons observing that pot tells me that it looks, why are you calling it a yam pot? It looks like a, a variation of a heart. So that's their perception. And it has that illusion of being a heart, a heart with the, with the veins out of it. But for me, no. My intention was the tuba on the ground and the, the tubas coming up and the, the, the leaf stems coming out of the top. So that was, that was the, the, the origin of the yam pot. But um, in speaking to my students, I told them to, when I go into the, sh they say, well, why yam pot? And I said, because when I go to buy yams and edos, I'm not buying a yam and edo and weighing, I say, a big one, a little one. I'm also looking at the form of the thing. If it has an interesting form, I will buy it. If it doesn't have an interesting form, I will not buy it. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I have to show is what I call the fungus, the sculpture. And, and, and it's, that is based on, again, my observation in the bush of the way in which um, a fungus will grow off of a tree at, at right angles, like a plate coming out of a tree. So that's that's the origin of that. So it, it has a relationship to Aussie's uh, vine as well. You can see a, a basic relationship to that, um, the fungus. Three-dimensional form. So you have to go around it to observe what's going on uh, from, different, from different angles. <laughs> The next one, the jaguar, is an interesting one because I was thinking of the jaguar and its relationship to the, the mythology of the Kanaima, the Kanaima within the, the indigenous culture, which is more than a mythology because the Kanaima also um, describes action, physical action that takes place. Um, the Kanaima that I was thinking about was more about as a spirit of the forest. I was thinking of the Kanaima as a spirit of the forest. And the creature that to me that represented that spirit was, was the jaguar. And so I made the jaguar into um, a mythical creature because it has its claws, there are only three claws, this fist, and it has three tails and it has double ears. But there again, I was playing around with mathematics. The difference between one, two, and three. I was playing around with that. But then people say, why didn't you put spots on the jaguar? And I said, because again, that in observing Jasper, I began to notice that the Jasper fractured into very strong uh, uh, rhomboid uh, geometrical shapes. And I said, I used to look at this thing and said, look at that. The mathematics of nature, how can that thing split with such exactitude. So I use that formation of, of the, the, the jasper uh, beds. I use that to portray 
um, put that in place of the spots on the Jaguar. So I was making use of a lot of things that I looked into, that I saw uh, in the bush to incorporate it into, the, into that painting, uh, um, the Jaguar. <laughs> interesting one. It's called Black Ants and Diamonds. Now, I went once with Bobby and um, Isaac Jerry, a very famous um, indigenous um, tracker, lead people into the forest, lead them back out again safe. But Isaac Jerry was unique. I said to Bobby, why is he unique? He said, because when you go into a certain area, you have to identify somebody who knows that area to take you where and around about and bring you back out. He said, but Isaac Jerry had the ability to go into any area and he will take you in and bring you back out. He, 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 he sort of transgressed that location thing that I only know what's here. And so went to Isaac Jerry. So we were walking along um, a path and I saw a leaf. I said, yeah, that's an interesting looking leaf, uh, pick it. Pick, pick the leaf, went along looking at it. And then we were walking, then I saw the tree again. So I said, Isaac, uh, what's the name of that tree? He said, what tree? I pointed to it. I said, because I picked this leaf just now. He looked, he said, no, wrong tree. I said, what? He said, that this leaf that you picked does not belong to this tree. And when I looked at it, really looked at it, I saw the difference. And it was a very subtle difference, a very subtle difference. So I could have gone and chopped down that tree, believing that's a tree I needed. No. Nope. So I said, wow, I thought I was seeing things. Well, I, I, I haven't started. So we're going along, going along again. And I said, you know, Isaac, I used to read books on Guyana and South America. And they would talk about a bird called the bell bird. And um, he said, yes. Um, I said, it has a very strange song. He said, he said yes, you heard one just now. Said, OK. And that is when I started to listen. It's like something electronic, <laughs> electronic. When I heard that sound again, I stopped. I said, Isaac, he looked at me, smiled. He said, yes, that's a bell bird. And I said to myself, how on earth could I not have heard that before? Because I was not being aware. I was not listening. I was listening at, but not listening into. So that's how I was able to hear that bird, the bell bird. I looked up, he said, no, you cannot see it because it lives high up in the forest. But I, we call it the Caribbean Institute in London. I did see an example. It's a little bird, about the size of Lusaki. The, the bell bird has a, a black water that comes down at the side of the street. Now when I examined, because I looked into, and I examined it carefully, I saw that the wattle that was hanging down had tiny, tiny hairs, but the hairs were arranged in a spiral. An amazing sight to see. But if I didn't look carefully, I would not have seen that. I saw that. Um, so we were walking along, then the events we had to pitch camp at the side of a river, um, the ring, it was low water. So the boat is down below. We have to climb up the bank and into a little Benab at the top in order to camp for the night. Well, that was a high class Benab because it had a wooden floor. It wasn't just an earthen floor, not a high class Benab. So Isaac said it was used by, by hunters during the hunting season. Okay, putting up hammocks and whatever. So while we're doing that, a spark, a tiny spark caught my eye on the floor, a spark, and I looked. And when I looked, it was a single ant that had a grain of sand in his jaws. A single ant. I looked around, no other ant, just that one ant, walking along the floor with a single grain of sand. So I said, what the hell? Um, what is a single ant doing by itself, for one, and two, with a grain of sand? So I started looking at it. 
and then it disappeared in a crack. So Jerry and Fernand said, oh, what the hell were you looking at so long? I said, man, I just saw an ant with a grain of sand, which could have been a diamond. So I was following the ant to see if it could lead me to where I can find diamonds. So they all thought that was hilarious. <laughs> but in my mind, it was a possibility. Now that was in 19, um, 1976, 1976, last year, um, Jocelyn Dow, who knows that painting, Jocelyn Dow um, sent to me half a video of somebody took in a jewelry shop. And in the video, there was an ant in the showcase and it had a diamond in its jaws. So when you think, when you think you're inventing things, oh man, no. Nature's ahead of you. So I thought I had a unique thought, unique my foot. <laughs> so that ant, and it's, it, it, that thing blew my mind. The ant was running in the glass case and it had a, it had literally had a, a diamond in its jaws. So my painting was very prophetic, black ants and diamonds, but it just shows this thing about observation. The other one I leave you with is the, the Caribbean man, which again is my looking and seeing <clears throat> looking and seeing into the into my social environment. I was walking along Camp Street near Regent Street once, and I saw a man coming down the road, walking on the pavement, and in his hands, he held bottles of perfume in his hands, and lady shoes, and on his head, he had a pile of ladies' hats on his head. And I stopped to observe this phenomenon. But he's walking, nobody else was looking at him, Paying any I was the only person I observed that as well. I looked around to see who was looking. Nobody else was paying attention to that man. And he was walking along with his friend, chatting with these things. Anybody stop him, buy a hat, buy a pair of shoes, buy some perfume. So to me, he was a walking, uh, um, a walking store. And so I thought about it and I said, that is a perfect image of the Caribbean man who has to find some way, somehow to exist, to live. And that is the way he decided he was going to live by becoming a walking shop. So that's why I made that painting. And, um, but the painting in my mind as well, the painting also implied the other ways in which the, the Caribbean man marketed his being himself. Ways in which I don't want to go into, but you can get it. So I thought about that. And so I came up with that painting called The, um, the Caribbean Man. And um, I, I allowed it as well to, to define things that could be sold. Like he's totally has shoes and belts around his feet and has a tray with perfume bottles and there's a tray of funny looking oranges below him and, and things like that. And then to put him in his environment, I show the sea, the representation of the sea, the blue waves, and also the outline of, of, of the houses, kind of tenement yard, chattel houses that you find I'm in Guyana and show the Caribbean. So that was my looking and seeing into the into the um, into the social social environment. So thank you for listening, and I hope it gives you uh, uh, um, food for thought, as they say. Thank you.